Hey guys, thank you so much for watching Cold Blood Creations here on YouTube. We're going to highlight in this video five mistakes that venomous keepers make that if you're not careful can sometimes end in tragedy. Many years ago, I met a man by the name of Delton Hilliard. In fact, we are going to dedicate this video to the memory of my friend Delton Hilliard. Delton had been working with venomous snakes longer than anyone else that I knew with the exception of maybe Bill Hoss. I asked Delton had he ever been envenomated by a snake and his answer to me was no. There was an old saying that used to go something like, it's not a matter of if you're gonna get bit, it's simply a matter of when. Delton had proved that that was not necessarily true, and so I wanted to know what his secret was to such a long career without ever having an accident. His first piece of advice to me was very, very simple. Never ever use your hands to do anything that they make a tool for. Every person that I have ever talked to that has been envenomated by a venomous snake, the story usually starts with them saying something like, well, I was reaching into the cage to do you fill in the blank, and that's where they were envenomated. This is something that Delton applied throughout his career. This is something I also have applied throughout my career, and I too have not ever been venomated thus far. Now, once again, that's not to say that we are perfect. It's just to say that we don't take unnecessary risks. I recommend a good set of tools. I recommend that you get and secure those tools before you even think about looking for your first venomous snake. Those tools should include an appropriate length set of hemostats for offering food items or placing or removing food in and out of the cage. I recommend a good snake hook of an appropriate length. I would suggest to you to get more than one snake hook in varying lengths because these animals, if you get them as a baby, obviously they're gonna grow. There is snake tongs. I don't really recommend the use of snake tongs for handling snakes, but they do make great tools when it comes to things like feeding or handling prey items or even placing or removing items in and out of a venomous snake's cage. Those of you who use hide boxes in your venomous snake cages, there is a simple little homemade tool that you can make that will allow you to block your venomous snakes in their cages so that you can remove things. It is made out of clear acrylic plastic so that you can see what's going on behind it. This makes things like removing uneaten prey items or removing water bowls safe and simple simply by blocking that venomous snake inside of its hide box while you service the cage. So get you a good set of tools, learn how to use them, and always rely on your tools to do things so that you can protect your fingers and your hands. So now when we talk about the use of tools versus the use of hands, someone always comes up, what do you think about guys who free handle venomous snakes? Now I know there are channels here on YouTube that are dedicated to doing just that. I would like to see this practice come to a stop because this unnecessary dangerous free handling and almost carnival tricks that you see employed by some of these guys, it creates a bad image for the reptile community as a whole. And I think it makes us all look like a bunch of irresponsible risk taking buffoons unnecessarily. Now the next thing that Delton told me when I was a young man, he said never ever ever handle a venomous snake if you're under the influence of medication, drugs, alcohol, or if you're just sick and not feeling well. Once again, this is great, great advice. Statistically speaking, most people bitten by venomous snakes in the United States are young men, and most of those young men are under the influence of alcohol. This video is not designed to tell you not to drink, but we all know that when you drink alcohol, your judgment is impaired. Everybody who drinks alcohol and gets a little bit tipsy believe that they have physical abilities and capabilities that they simply do not have. This is no different when it comes to working with venomous snakes. There is a level of courage that you would not have when you're sober. There's usually a level of confidence that you shouldn't have even when you're sober, much less when you're impaired. And the results can sometimes be pretty devastating. So anytime you want to drink alcohol, make sure if you have venomous snakes and you need to do anything, they are simply off limits. 
This is going to take just some self-discipline. One of the things that Delton told me, he said, if ever I decide to take a drink, even one sip off of a beer, that is the time when I say, no matter who comes over, I want to show them any kind of snake. If I pop a beer, I do not open a venomous snake cage. It kept Delton safe. It's kept me safe over these years. No impaired handling, whether drugs, alcohol, medication, or if you're just simply tired and not at your best. All right, the third point in this video, cohabitating snakes together. This is absolutely a problem. Now there's a lot of people out there that believe that snakes should not be cohabitated anytime for any reason. We do not hold that opinion on some species. However, I will tell you when it comes to any species of venomous snake, I believe one snake, one cage. The reason is simple. It's almost like the point about handling a snake while you're impaired. In order to safely handle and work with venomous snakes, you need to be 100%. You need to be able to focus and concentrate on the animal you're working with. If you have more than one snake in a cage at a time, it poses some problems. If you're getting a snake out of the cage, you're focusing on the one animal that you are working with and your attention is not solely devoted to the second animal in the cage. That has caused several, several bites in the reptile community. People cohabitating two snakes, they go in to feed one and both snakes go for the prey item at the same time. The keeper ends up getting caught up in the middle or removing moving a snake, focusing on that snake, and being envenomated by the second snake in the cage. If you can't maintain the snake, in a cage, then simply do not get another venomous snake until it can be properly and safely housed. That way you don't have to worry about two snakes in the same cage and divided attention. So speaking of having more than one snake in a cage, I wanna share a little something with you that happened to me many, many years ago. When it comes to pit vipers, such as rattlesnakes, cottonmouths, copperheads, here in North America, they give live birth. A friend of mine brought a wild caught Eastern Diamondback rattlesnake over to my place and he wanted me to sex it for him to tell him if it was a male or a female. We secured it in a plastic piece of tubing so that it couldn't bite and we sexed the animal. While we had the snake out of the cage, I decided that I would go in and change his water bowl. I reached into the cage and was about to remove the water bowl and I noticed some of the bedding, which was a shaving, like a pine shaving, I noticed it move. Once I noticed the movement in that pine bedding, I reached over, got a snake hook, moved around in the cage. What we found out is that my buddy had caught a gravid female Eastern Diamondback. And upon keeping her in this cage, she had given birth unbeknownst to him or to myself. Had I reached into that cage, one of those nine babies that were alive hiding underneath that bedding could have very easily bitten and envenomated me. So pit vipers pose a little bit of a threat in that they do give live birth. There is no such thing as rattlesnake eggs. So if you're keeping those, you always want to look around the cage, especially during the breeding season, which is usually around August to November for pit vipers in North America. Make sure that you don't have a litter of babies hiding somewhere in that cage that you're not aware of. Now, our fourth point, caging. Venomous snakes pose an inherent risk not only to the keeper, but also to the community as a whole. Now the state of Florida has done a good job of trying to make sure that those people keeping venomous snakes follow some safety guidelines and proper caging so that their animals don't escape. There's a lot of people who think that this is government intrusion and a government sticking their nose in places they have no business. And at one time I would have agreed with those people. However, I've been in this long enough. I have seen seen a lot of snake collections out there and people housing venomous snakes in ways that I'm thankful to know that there is now a government agency that are looking in and making sure to the best of their ability that those people are housing them appropriately. I've seen people house venomous snakes in Rubbermaid tubs uh, with books stacked on top of them and all kind of crazy things that just is not safe or secure. Now, it's one thing if you're keeping snakes that are native to your area. Like here in Georgia, we are not allowed to keep without special licensing and insurance any non-native venomous reptile. However, if you're keeping an exotic venomous snake and it escapes, 
then there poses a big threat to the community simply because of the lack of any venoms should someone get bit by a snake that's normally not indigenous to their area. For this reason, any venomous snake, but especially those that are what's considered exotic venomous, should be absolutely housed safely. Now, this should be without saying, but we need to say this. If you have young children in your home, do not house venomous snakes in your home with your children. Think of the safety of your kids. Now we say that, but there are people who do that and that is posing a risk and a threat to your family. You should always have some building away from your home where your children don't have free access to house your venomous snakes just in the event of an escape. Also, venomous snake cages should be locked. It doesn't matter whether your state requires it or not, it's just plain common sense. We put locks on every cage that we have that houses a venomous snake. They're in a building that also stays locked and we do our best to make sure that there is no way possible we have checks and double checks to make sure every animal is housed safely, securely, and every cage is locked. The keys are put out of the reach of anybody. And we also have rules that no one can take a venomous snake out of its cage unless there's more than one person present at the time. Before you get any venomous snake, make sure you have an appropriate cage that is absolutely escape proof. Make sure you have your tools, but above all things, do not house venomous snakes in your living quarters, especially around your children. Now, speaking of housing, so far a lot of people like to use rack systems when keeping large number of snakes and there's certainly nothing wrong with doing this. However, when it comes to venomous snakes, racks pose an additional danger, especially the type of racks like these seen behind me, and it's because they're not visible. These type of racks have been used for many, many years. In fact, Bill Hoss was probably one of the first guys I ever knew to house cobras in this way. Although more than one keeper have been bitten when they reach over and open one of these with their hands. If you're using rack systems to keep venomous snakes, always, without exception, use a tool or a snake hook to pull the rack in and to push the rack out. Never want to walk up to a snake cage with a venomous snake and open it with your bare hands. You're just asking to get envenomated. If you don't believe me, look up the story of Chuck Hurd and how he was envenomated by Eastern Diamondback doing that very thing. Now, our last and final point is going to be one that's going to be very controversial to some people in the reptile community. However, it does have to be said. We do not condone any keeper keeping an illegal venomous snake. Number one, it poses a threat to your own safety. If you're keeping a exotic venomous snake illegally, chances are if an accident happens and you're bitten, there's not gonna be any antivenom available immediately for you. And this could be a matter of life and death. If you keep a venomous snake illegally and you're bitten, now you've got to take precious moments that you should be looking for medical care to decide in your mind, do I want to seek medical care knowing full well that I'm probably going to be arrested and my animal confiscated or do I want to risk that to save my life. After you're envenomated is not a time you want to be making decisions like that. There's been a number of people who have died from venomous snakes that were kept illegally because they simply did not want to risk being arrested or prosecuted for keeping an animal illegally. Therefore, after they were bitten, they didn't seek medical help. They just hoped that they would wing it and they ended up dying as a result of not seeking any medical care. Now, it has been a reaction of many states and local governments to outright ban the keeping of venomous snakes. Personally, I believe that is one of the most dangerous things that any government can do because people are simply going to do what they want to do. There is no law that is going to stop people from doing it. Just because you ban keeping venomous snakes, you're never going to keep people who want to keep them from keeping them. We know how well it worked when they banned the smoking of marijuana. Did absolutely nothing but create an underground trade. Same thing in the venomous reptile community. They can outlaw them. They will always 
always be those who are willing to risk it in order to keep a snake that they want. It would be far wiser on the behalf of governments if they would institute a permitting system. At least that way people have the opportunity to do what they want to do without having to risk things associated with the illegal keeping of a reptile. That way also the community at large is safer because a person keeping a venomous snake is not going to notify authorities in the event of an escape. They simply would be foolish to do so because they know full well they would be arrested and even worse if someone else was hurt by that animal. So if they were under a permitting system that allowed them to do so and didn't outright punish them for a mistake, they would be much more likely to go to the authorities and say, hey, I just want everybody to know um, I had a cobra or a gaboon viper that escaped. I believe it's in my facility let's hunt this thing until we find it. If it's illegal, they're simply going to keep their mouth shut and deny any knowledge of it if in the event an accident happens. So we believe that keeping venomous snakes illegally because of government intrusion is one thing that creates additional unneeded risk. But if you live in an area where keeping venomous snakes are currently illegal and you choose to ignore that risk, you got to understand you also assume the greater responsibility of prosecution, arrest, possibly even death. Hey guys, once again, I want to thank you for watching this video. Now, I understand some of the things that we've talked about in this video can be controversial. Some of it may be offensive. However, we have decided here that we're going to put out content that we believe to be truthful and honest, whether it's offensive or not. That being said, the rest of this video I want to dedicate to the memory of my friend, one of the guys who shared his wisdom with me, and I'm forever thankful, Mr. Delton Hilliard. He's surely gone, but not forgotten. You guys, thank you so much for watching Cold Blood Creations. Y'all have a great day.